Well, fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's kind of interesting because I'm here at the Medal of Honor Heritage Center. I was here earlier this morning because we were, the, the Scobie Rogers family very, very graciously has, has uh, given Dick Scobie's Space Congressional Medal of Honor for the center. And so we've been here and then we've had students in and out all day. So I've been teaching classes and it's interesting that I would be teaching reconstruction this afternoon because I've spent spending so much time talking about civil war and Andrews Raiders and such. I have to share with you all when I first started teaching in 1972 and I was teaching in a very rural county in middle Tennessee and I brand new teacher straight out of college I had a, a fellow teacher come to me and she said Linda you know when you finish the Civil War you might want to just skip over Reconstruction and just sort of move into Teddy Roosevelt in the 20th century and of course I sort of looked at her because I had had been very uh, interested in Reconstruction had studied H. Van Woodward and and uh, John Hope Franklin and a, a number of, of Reconstruction historians and I said well, why would I do that? And she said, well, you know, it's just all so recent, it's still incredibly painful. And I think that that's the difficulty in talking about reconstruction is that we come out of the American Civil War. Civil War is still very much alive in our historical memory because it was a civil war. You know, it, we can we can distance ourselves when we talk about the Spanish-American War. We can even sort of distance ourselves when we talk about the War of 1812, even our American Revolution, even with all of our pride, we distance it. But the Civil War, you know, just sort of ripped families apart, ripped states apart, certainly ripped this nation apart. And, and I was sort of struck. I found a quote that I, I use sometimes in classes, and it's Eric Foner, who is a, a, a well-known historian, and in talking about the American Civil War, and this, these are his words, he said, the war destroyed the institute of slavery, ensured the survival of the union and set in motion economic and political changes that laid the foundation for the modern nation. During reconstruction, the United States made its first attempt to build an egalitarian society on the ashes of slavery and the fire, the coals were still hot. I, I love that statement because it's so very, very true. So today we're gonna to talk about reconstruction, what the attempts were to reconstruct the nation after it had been deconstructed with the Civil War. And then we're gonna take a look at sort of how reconstruction itself then is deconstructed and falls apart. So um, all of this, we have to kind of remember that between 1863 and 1877, which is technically the period that we look at as reconstruction. I'll divide it into three phases for you in a few minutes. You have the US government attempting a task which would be to integrate what had formerly been roughly 4 million enslaved individuals. And that integration will occur after the nation had been bitter, bitterly divided by the American Civil War. Now, um, when I say bitterly divided, you also have to account for the fact that there are over 600,000 casualties in the American Civil War, which makes it one of the most costly wars in which this nation has ever participated. So Reconstruction is a very, very difficult period of time because we're, we're attempting to evoke tremendous change during a period of time when people are still grappling with the past. So the next slide that you're gonna see sort of outlines um, wartime reconstruction. And we consider wartime reconstruction to be those attempts to plan for the reconstruction of the Union once the American Civil War is over. And by December of 1863, most of those in the US government believed that the Union was going to be victorious. Now, it was not a given, you know, two years into the war and nearly a year after Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation, Jubilee Day, January the 1st of 1863, um, President Lincoln begins working on what he considered to be an amnesty plan. And it's an amnesty or 10% plan. And it's a critical thing to remember that Lincoln, 
you know, Lincoln had had said throughout, actually from the time that he ran for Senate in 1858 in Illinois until he is elected president in 1860, takes office in 1861, and, you know, takes office with seven of the deep southern states having already withdrawn from the Union, and then four other states once uh, Fort Sumter occurs will withdraw from the Union. For Lincoln, the big issue was always the Union. He, he wanted the Union preserved, and that's what he talks about in his speeches, that's what he talks about in his writings. And so what he's going to do is that he is going to look at a plan in which he will be able to bring back in those states which he considered to be in rebellion. Remember that Lincoln doesn't believe that the states have ever truly left the Union. That he doesn't believe that that is a legal process in them leaving. So he wants to reconcile, bring them back together into the Union, and he wants it to be as painless as possible, which of course is a, an, an incredibly wonderful dream. What he came up with was something he called the 10% plan. And the 10% plan said that 10% of any Confederate States voters had to sign a pledge, an oath of allegiance to the Union and once 10% of the Confederate veterans in that state had signed that oath of allegiance, then the state could begin to be readmitted technically back into the Union. Now, you know, included in his plan were things like a full pardon and restoration of property, excluding the enslaved people um, who had taken part in the war against the Union and those who had made it north quite frankly, north across the Tennessee River and even in here into Chattanooga. And Lincoln wanted to make the process as easy as possible. 10% he believed would be attainable. Almost immediately, Lincoln gets in trouble with the Congress, which at that point was controlled by the radical Republicans in both the House and the Senate. And they believed that his plan was far too lenient. Um, they in fact, in their debates, and it's interesting to go back and, and read the congressional notes, in their debates, they truly wanted nothing less than what they refer to as a total transformation of Southern society. Um, so in July of 1864, they passed a piece of legislation called the Wade Davis Bill, and it is named for um, Benjamin Wade, who's in the Senate, and Henry Davis, who is in the House, and the bill called for 50% of the white uh, males in the rebel states had to swear an oath of loyalty, and then they could convene a state constitutional convention, and then with direction, they would write a state constitutional, uh, state constitution in which they would basically affirm the rights of um, African-Americans who resided in their states, and they, there's a whole list of things that they had to do. Um, Lincoln, Lincoln is not ready to move to such a harsh thing, and he will pocket veto the, the Wade Davis bill. Um, and he does it in a hope of getting the support of white Southerners who will recognize that the 10% plan that he's proposing is much more agreeable to them and that they will move forward quickly once the war is over. He wants them to look to him for leadership and not to Congress because he sees Congress, he believes, as retaliatory. Congress then will, in uh, statements that they issue, will refer to Lincoln attempting an executive usurpation of what should be the qualifications for readmittance to the union. So technically the Wade Davis bill was never implemented, but it was always sitting there on the books as a reminder to leaders in the South as to what, if Congress got its way, what reconstruction was gonna look like. Well, you know, one of the things that so many people were wrestling with about the Emancipation Proclamation, which you will remember freed the slaves in the states in rebellion, did not free the state, slaves in the states in which they were not in rebellion. Those states were not in rebellion. So no freeing of slaves in Maryland, Delaware, um, uh, no freeing of states and uh, slaves in uh, Kentucky. 
but there was a concern about, so if we free these 4 million enslaved people who in many cases have not been allowed the privilege of education, they, they do not know how to read and write, many of them the only skills that they have marketable skills as such are farming skills but they have no land so will they not be forced back into a situation that will be still in effect slavery in in something other than a different name um and lincoln in january of 1865 um really begins to try and think about how, what, you know, what options are available for former slaves? How are they gonna become productive, engaged citizens? And in January of 1865, General Sherman had issued a military order, field order number 15, which roughly redistributed 400,000 acres of land in low country Georgia and South Carolina, divided into 40 acre plots to newly freed black families. And when the, the Freedmen's Bureau would be established months later, it was created partly to help redistribute those lands in Georgia and South Carolina's eyes from Southern whites to former slaves within their states. It gave legal title to each of those African-American formerly enslaved families to 40 acres and a mule, the program is called. Um, when the war is over, just as a, a side note, when the war is over and Andrew Johnson finds himself in the White House, he will return most of that land to the former white slave owners. Um, and that was because he realized that there was no way of implementing, there was no way of enforcing that even though they had roughly 900 Freedmen's Bureau employees in those Southern states that were be, going to be undergoing reconstruction, they simply could not be everywhere at the same time. And it was going to be really, really difficult. He decided instead that he would, would sort of direct the Freedmen's Bureau to concentrate more on starting schools, um, providing clothing, teaching people to read and write so that they could become actively engaged citizens by voting. That was a, an issue that Johnson actually approved of. Now, April 14th, 1865, you know, I can remember being a child and reading one of the books about the Civil War that was called Across Five Aprils, you know, beginning in April of 1861 and the war not ending until later in April. But on April the 14th, 1865, I think we're all familiar with the story that, you know, six days after Robert E. Lee has put down, um, has surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, um, which effectively ended the Civil War. And it took a little bit longer for Joe Johnson and some of the troops out West to surrender. But in effect, the war is over. Um, President Lincoln, along with his wife, Mary, and two of their friends will attend a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. And, you know, it's interesting because Lincoln had had a premonition just days before his assassination that he had envisioned his body lying in state in the White House and, and was fearful that it was some sort of an omen. Now, what's also interesting though, is that he had just, I'm trying to think, a month and a half, 40 days or so before his assassination, he had given his second uh, inaugural address. And within it, you know, he attempts to convey what he really believed his role was in reconstructing this, the nation following this divisive American Civil War. He had said these words, which probably all of you remember, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds. Of course, he will not ever be allowed to do this. And, and one of the ironic things that about Lincoln's assassination is the fact that John Wilkes Booth, who is a, a very loyal Southerner who believes he's doing the South a favor by assassinating Abraham Lincoln, instead will unleash the forces of retaliation. And some of them will, will see in the reconstruction plans that will be taken 
uh, to attempt to reconstruct the South. So next slide takes us to the second phase of reconstruction, which we know as um, presidential reconstruction. Well, wartime reconstruction, I think we skipped one. I'm looking, yeah, congressional reconstruction, I've called it there. Um, when you look at, at uh, no, actually you're right, Jennifer, my problem, my fault, back, you can back up a little. Yes, sorry, uh, presidential reconstruction. I'm getting ahead of myself in my thoughts. Um, Andrew Johnson, so Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. We've talked about this before. Andrew Johnson, who was probably one of the less well-equipped uh, vice presidents who had only been vice president for a few weeks is thrust into the presidency. And he is already in trouble when he becomes president because he is from a state in rebellion. He is the only, the only US Senator from a state of the 11 states that are in rebellion. He's the only one who did not give his seat up in the US Senate. He, for his loyalty to the union will have been appointed military governor of Tennessee. And then because Tennessee last state out and will most likely the belief is be the first state back in, Abraham Lincoln will choose Andrew Johnson as his vice presidential running mate because he believes that in having a southerner in the office, the executive branch with him will make reconciliation easier. The best laid plans of mice and men sometimes just do not go the way that you expect them to. Lincoln is assassinated. We have a southerner in the presidency during this period of reconstruction. And what you're gonna find is that if anything is going to drive the radical Republicans in Congress crazy, it is Andrew Jackson or Andrew Johnson. And part of that is not that just that Johnson is a southerner, but part of it is the fact that Johnson is stubborn hot tempered, um, unwilling often to listen to the advice of those around him. And so he's sort of a nightmare waiting to happen. So Johnson comes into power and in May of, of um, 1865, he offers his own amnesty plan. And he basically offers general amnesty to any Southern white person, male, who will pledge future loyalty to the U.S. government, and the only ones who would not be automatically amnestied would be former Confederate leaders who would have to receive individual pardons. Um, his plan also would give Southern whites the power to retain their property, with the exception of the slaves, which I mentioned a while ago, and it uh, granted the states the right to start a new government with their own provisional governments. It did nothing, there were, there were no restraints within his plan to deter white landowners from continuing to sort of exploit their former slaves. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't think forward to think that there might be a tenant system that will go into place, sharecropping, other things which are going to be virtually slavery. Um, December the 6th of 1865, the 13th Amendment will be ratified. You know, it had gone through Congress and then it had to go out and be ratified by three fourths of the state. So that occurs in 1865. Um, and I'm sorry, and I have a date wrong there. I've reversed numbers. It should be 1865. You've got the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery with the exception of as a punishment for a crime. So that, that's really kind of interesting. It's the first of what we call the Civil War uh, constitutional amendments. And I think so often when we look at those Civil War constitutional amendments, we assume that they occurred sort of bam, bam, bam immediately upon the fall of the South and the beginning of reconciliation. And that's not true at all. As sort of a you know, you've got that occurring in 1865 and almost immediately you begin to have enacted individual state by individual state predominantly in the deep South. So we're talking South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, some in Texas, but not as much because Texas is a little farther removed from all of this. And what they will do is their local provisional legislatures will enact what they're gonna call the Black Codes. And the Black Codes were an attempt to, um, to basically eliminate any 
upward mobility socially, economically for those people who were formerly enslaved. So the black codes, you know, there were vagrancy laws. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't have gainful employment and you were deemed to be idle or disorderly, you could immediately be forced either into jail or into a forced apprenticeship that then would allow white employers to use black former enslaved people uh, could use them as prison labor, bring them out into their fields and, and basically treat them as though they were slaves. Once again, the black codes will extend to being a lot more than just that. And we'll see that in reconstruction as we move forward. Um, I'm gonna grab, one of the things I'm gonna do while we're talking is I'm gonna grab my, clock, my phone because I realized there's not a clock in this room and I will get carried away and be talking and I will be talking long before I shouldn't be talking. So, okay, now I know where I am. So let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about, so, you know, we've got this presidential plan. We had Lincoln's plan, which is 10%. We have Johnson's plan, which is a very sort of wide open arms reconciliation uh, attempt to bring the states back into the union. And as both of them, had, had worked through their plans. We saw with the Wade Davis bill, we will see with all the attempts to limit Andrew Johnson's power as president from the Tenure of, Act off, uh, Tenure of Office Act that will lead to his impeachment. There is going to be a, a real attempt for Congress because Congress will say this, this should not be presidential. You know, the act of joining the union the act of seceding for the union, those are all constitutional issues. And those issues that are constitutional, that are legislative, that means that it is the prerogative of the legislature to determine what the process will be by which we will come back into the union. That is not an executive. The executive simply, except in the rare cases in modern days with executive orders, the executive in theory simply carries out as the administrator the actions of Congress while the Supreme Court, of course, interprets the, the constitutionality of those actions. So Andrew Johnson finds himself by early 1867 in a figurative knockdown drag out battle over who's going to be in charge of reconstruction and what is the reconstructed United States going to look like and how easily or how painful is this process going to be. Well, you have Congress reaching forward and beginning in March of 1867, and they're going to attempt to take control of the reconstruction. So the first piece of legislation that they will pass is something that they will literally call the Reconstruction Act of 1867. And it outlines their plan for readmission of all the rebel states, no distinction between Deep South and Border South, except for Tennessee. It divides, it pulls Tennessee out divides the other 10 states into five military districts. Each would be required to write a new constitution, uh, which would have to be approved by the majority of voters, including African-American males over the age of 21 in that state. And each would, in addition, be required to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendment. Now, 13th Amendment has been ratified. 14th Amendment is in the process of being ratified. And once that state, South Carolina, Georgia, Texas, had done those things, then they could begin the process of gaining full recognition and federal representation in Congress, but not until they had done that. Following on the heels of that, a little over a year later, we have the 14th Amendment will be ratified. And the 14th Amendment, one of our cornerstone amendments in the US Constitution, um, as it will be interpreted in the next 170 years. But initially it granted citizenship to all persons. And here's the quote, I'm gonna read it for you. Born or naturalized in the United States, including former enslaved persons and provided all citizens with equal protection under the law, extending the provisions of the Bill of Rights to the state today, but not automatically in the very beginning. Um, and this amendment, the 14th Amendment, basically allowed the federal government to punish states that were not allowing citizens the right to vote by reducing their representation in Congress. So that's a pretty serious move. If you are, if we can 
look at your voter registrations. We can look at your roles. We can see that you are systematically turning away former enslaved people who should be entitled to vote and you're not allowing them to vote, then we, the federal government, has the right to lower your representation. It will no longer just be based on population, which is the formula population versus two senators per state. The federal government now has the right to come in and to oversee your representation. Well, that's a pretty serious move. Then, you know, two years later, 1870, the 15th Amendment is passed. And, you know, the 14th Amendment had begun to set up sort of that step by step of what it truly means to be a citizen. We, we have now, and we have freed the former enslaved uh, peoples. We have uh, given them their right to citizenship, which will include their future right to vote. And then the 15th Amendment, which is passed in February of 1870, prohibit states from disenfranchising, which is a nice way of saying that they cannot keep people from their right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, voting has historically been a state administered right. You know, Tennessee's right to vote might, as at that point in time, the right to vote in Tennessee might have had different criteria than the right to vote in Georgia than the right to vote in Louisiana. And what you will find is that, that many of the Southern states as a part of their black codes or as a part of their attempt to disenfranchise those people who are formerly enslaved, they will begin to institute other requirements for the right to vote. So it's not just, you know, that, that the, 15th Amendment gives you the right to protection. You can't be denied the right to vote based on race, color, or previous serv in servitude. But what if you can't read? What if you can't pay a poll tax? What if you didn't have a grandfather who voted? Um, all sorts of things that you will find that will begin to be manipulated in an attempt to keep those people who were formerly enslaved from becoming active participating citizens. Um, 1870, you know, just 20 days after you have the 15th Amendment uh, ratified, you have the very first African American um, who is elected to the US Congress. And he is elected by the, the Mississippi State Legislature. And he will be going to Washington and he will serve the last two years of a previous term. And he was an interesting trial case because Hiram Ravels is an AME minister, much love within the community. And they believed that he was the ideal person to sort of see what would happen. Now, during the time that, that we technically consider re reconstruction, 1863 to 1877, you're gonna have 16 African-Americans that will serve in Congress. Um, Black men held three congressional seats from South Carolina. And in South Carolina, you will actually have a, a, a person of color who will serve on the US Supreme Court. Across the South, you're gonna have over 600 black men serving in state legislatures. Um, Blanche Bruce is probably the other name that you might recognize because he's another Mississippian who actually was elected in 1875 to the US Senate and will serve a full term. So, you know, there is that testing of right to vote. Does right to vote mean right to serve? How, how much are we gonna move forward in this attempt to, to, um, to enforce equality so that the rights of citizenship are not denied based on the, right, right, the uh, conditions of race, color, or former sovereignty. Well, the next thing that you see on your list reminds us that not everyone was happy at seeing these sorts of changes occurring in the South. Um, taking a quick sip, but in an attempt, you know, we can, we can talk about and we can debate the original intent of the Ku Klux Klan, but we know that that by 1871, you know, the original Ku Klux Klan had been formed in 1865 in Tennessee. And, and they, if you look at that research, look at the background, they will talk about, you know, the, the things, their purposes for, for um, being formed. And it was not necessarily 
in every instance what it will become by 1860 or by 1871, but it's hard for anyone to look at the Ku Klux Klan after 1871 and not understand exactly what their purpose is. And their purpose was, as they acted to suppress black economic political rights in the South during this period of, of reconstruction, it, it becomes a white supremacist group, similar to the Knights of the White Camellia, which were most, um, most well known in Louisiana, equally vile organization, but they will attempt by burning of crosses, by, by legislating black codes, by terrorizing black people and the white people who supported equal rights for those who were black, the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan will become an organization of terror in the South. And that's pretty clearly documented. You realize that by March the 1st of 1875, Congress knows that they have to take a step farther. You, they have a Reconstruction Act, they've passed the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments, which have been ratified by the states, as is the process identified in the Constitution. And yet, and yet very little is changing. You know, you, it may look different if you see it in writing, but if you go out and you visit, it looks the same, whether you're talking about sharecropping, tenement farming, tenant farming, or you're talking about slavery, it, it appeared that the South was not making great inroads toward any sort of an egalitarian society. So in 1875, you have the US Congress passing the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and it's the first of those pieces of legislation of its nature. And it's considered to be the last piece of congressional reconstruction that will occur. And it, it was designed to guarantee African-Americans equal treatment in areas, in areas like public transportation, uh, public accommodations, the right to serve on juries. However, it passes in 1875, but in 1883, it will be overturned in the US Supreme Court because they will rule that that the United States government does not have a right that the, to use the constitution to, expand, to extend to telling private businesses and other organizations how they may operize or operate in a commerce situation. So Civil Rights Act is an attempt to do a lot of what we, those of us that are old enough saw occurring in the 1960s and into the 1970s. And that was the opening of accommodations, transportation, um, you know, all those sorts of things that we think of as the civil rights movement of the 1960s, almost 100 years later. But the Supreme Court, in a very narrow inter interpretation of the Commerce Clause, um, simply ruled that Congress could not interfere in private enterprise and in commerce. So the end of the Reconstruction, our next, um, when we look at the next, well, Let's talk a little bit about what happens with the end of Reconstruction. So, you know, you've got a number of things that will again begin to occur as we look at the end of Reconstruction because we're not making a lot of progress. We, uh, we have certainly, the American Civil War has ended, the Union has been declared the winner, but not much is happening in the South. And so we're moving beyond legislative and we're gonna see that instead of legislature, we're going to attempt, the US government is going to attempt to, to deal with the issues by using the Supreme Court. But what's going to happen is that you're gonna find the US Supreme Court because of its composition, not always being supportive of the attempts that are being made as far as reconstruction. So, you know, even, and let me preface this by saying, I think we have this image that the North is, you know, everybody's happy and joining arms and singing Kumbaya and there is total integration of population. And that's not true. You know, the majority racism remained a pervasive force in the North. It was racism, not only against African-Americans, but in, cer in certain communities against the dominant immigrant population that might be a minority population, but also very active. Um, and by the early 1870s, you have a lot of people in the North who are just tired of all this attention. We've been building up for the war for the entire 1850s, much longer than that, but really at sort of a fast pace, 1850s, we have 
fought the war 1861 to 1865, we are now, you know, into the early 1870s, and we have been attempting to to do this period of reconstruction, bringing the union back together, guaranteeing equality for all people. And quite frankly, the American public's attention span is just about tired. They're just sort of tired of this whole thing. They are, they are beginning to blame the problems with reconstruction primarily on in two areas. One, the radical Republicans have just gone too far. And two, you begin to find in the North and the South, both this, um, this look at social history, um, this look of intellectual history, which is studying patterns of, of reading and writing and all those sorts of things. And, and you have people beginning to say, you know, maybe, maybe what we need is more of a caretaker government. Maybe there is a, an inferiority among those black voters and that's part of the problem with us being able to have these changes you know the american public sometimes we grow very weary of, of difficult problems and because reconstruction is not an easy fix because of integrating society after you know 200 years of, of lack of education and all the other things that we know were part of that that system, you know, it, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. Well, at the same time, you have a couple of key US Supreme Court decisions that just sort of rip things apart. You've got a, um, a decision that occurs in 1873. It's the slaughterhouse cases, and it's a bundling of cases together, but it basically the U.S. Supreme Court, in interpreting the 14th Amendment, says it applies only to former enslaved persons and protects only rights guaranteed to them by the federal government, but not by the states. So, in effect, what it says is, you know, if it is a violation of a federal right, then the U.S. government can step in and do something. If it's a violation of a state right, you know, the states have the right to determine who participates in different segments of their society. So the U.S., you know, is not going to, the U.S. government's not going to get involved in that. Well, only three years later, in a, a, a court decision that also reaches the U.S. Supreme Court, which was a highly volatile case, it's U.S. versus Kirkshank, and it's 1876. It comes out of Louisiana. And in this case, you have three men, three white men who have been convicted in connection with the massacre of more than 100 black men in Colfax, Louisiana. And, and, and they have been convicted, they have been sentenced and they appeal the case and they had been found guilty, not only of violating the civil rights of, of those black individuals who had been massacred, but of the 1870 Enforcement Act, which basically banned conspiracies to deny citizens constitutional rights and and there had been a conspiracy movement in this that was based basically on literacy and the ability to learn and everything and it had been orchestrated really to kind of take care of the Klu Ku Klux Klan to ban the Ku Klux Klan but instead you know these three men find themselves in in court find themselves declared guilty they appeal it to the u.s supreme court and the u.s supreme court overturns their conviction um you know it says we we really you know we can't we can't act on this because we are not aware you know where the documentation is not great on the conspiracy and everything so you have the supreme court ruling that the 19th Amendment process, uh, promise of due process and equal protection should cover violation of states' rights. But what you have the court saying in Krushank is, as it had said in Slaughterhouse, Slaughterhouse said, mm, no, nope, can't protect them, you know, only if it's a federal violation, can't protect against states' rights. Krushank says, okay, maybe the 14th Amendment extends to states' rights, but it does not protect individuals from individual actions of other people. Uh, even if it is in an attempt to disenfranchise voters and reassert white control over the South. Your mind sort of reels when you listen to that interpretation, but you know this is also a period of time in which only 20 years earlier, 
we had had the Dred Scott decision and only you know, 20 years later, we will have Plessy v. Ferguson as a decision. So you know, the level that we hold our Supreme Court accountable to as far as interpretation of the constitution today was not necessarily evident, especially in the second half of the 19th century. So how, do, how does reconstruction end? Well, in the election of 1867, the nation's going to be going to the voter polls to decide who is going to secede former General Ulysses S. Grant as president. You know, Andrew Johnson had completed the term, uh, Lincoln's term, and then had not been reelected. Ulysses S. Grant had been elected in 1868. He serves four years. He's reelected. He serves four more years. And we get to 1876, and, and we have you know, new candidates, you know, Grant, who is not well, Grant, who has had a rather difficult presidency, um, is not running again. And so you're going to have two new candidates appearing on the scene. The Democrats nominate Samuel Tilden, who's the governor of New York. And it appears that Samuel Tilden is in a lead against the Republican candidate who, um, you know, the, the Republican candidate is Rutherford B. Hayes, We'll see a later member of his family, Benjamin Hayes, serving also. He's coming out of Ohio. And when it comes right down to after the votes are counted and everything, the returns from three of the states that just happen to be Southern states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina are in dispute. And Hayes needs those votes to be able to defeat Tilden. Tilden needs those votes to affirm his victory because he's ahead. So they have to come up with some sort of a compromise and it will be thrown into the House of Representatives because those states together represent 19 electoral votes and ultimately, as we all know, the electoral votes determine the outcome. So it swings into um, the House and the way to resolve that then is Congress will decide You've got the Democrats in control of the House, the Republicans are in control of the Senate, so they decide to compromise by putting together this sort of bipartisan commission that will determine how the electoral votes will be counted, how they will be determined. You know, one of the votes in Georgia or in South Carolina is really in dispute. And it is a very contestuous time, and you know, the nation's hanging in the balance. And what it really boils down to is that they come up with a compromise plan in which the votes will go to Rutherford B. Hayes. The Southerners will give their votes to Rutherford B. Hayes if Rutherford B. Hayes will declare an end to Reconstruction. And what you're gonna find is that's exactly what happens. The Compromise of 1877 will be passed almost immediately after uh, Hayes's inauguration. It ordered the federal troops to be withdrawn from Louisiana, Louisiana and South Carolina, where they had been protecting um, claims, claimants to the governorships in those states. Um, it effectively ends reconstruction because now there's no military occupation. And for the most part, even in those states where Southern whites pledged that they would uphold the rights of their black citizens, they moved very quickly to reverse as many of the reconstruction policies as possible. You're gonna see the disenfranchisement of black voters, um, often through intimidation and violence, but also under just strange things like moving precincts and, you know, uh, the literacy acts and the grandfather clauses and all of that, you're also going to see that there will be racial segregation, which will now begin to be enforced by law in what that we will know as the Jim Crow law system that will endure until the mid 20th century and the 20th century. So what we find is, you know, what Abraham Lincoln had in mind that we would all come back together, that we would, you know, be in touch with the greater angels of our own character isn't what happens. And the last slide will sort of remind you of what Jim Crow looked like. Um, and Jim Crow, you know, the Jim Crow laws that you will see across the South, you'll see Jim Crow and segregation in, in parts of the North also. It's not just a Southern thing, but you will find it certainly much more systematically enforced in the South. You'll see that division between um, 
white citizens and citizens of color. And interestingly, that's a, a real issue in Louisiana because there were those in Louisiana who were mulatto or octroon, or you in some cases even had those of, of other foreign nationalities whose skin tones may have been darker that will get sort of swept into that Jim Crow law segregation. Um, you know, Reconstruction is one of those emotional periods of time and it, it still is a difficult conversation to have because we're looking at it through the lens of 21st century and finding it just so hard to believe that systematically decisions were made based on race, based on, you know, it, even for those of us who are women that, you know, women were not entitled to, to the civil rights until much, much later. Um, Timothy has a question. He says, Civil War constitutional amendments was ratification requirement met with just Northern states. Uh, is that the basis for some of the, uh, the arguments against? Yes, in most cases it is because until those Southern states had rewritten their constitutions and came back in, they were not counted. Now, the 14th and 15th amendments had some Southern support because that was the only way that they could come back into the union was to support the ratification of those uh, amendments, but it doesn't mean that their legislatures wholeheartedly agreed and were willing to endorse what those policies meant. I'm wondering how many of you, and I may be the only one who is old enough to, uh, to do, who remembers divisions along racial lines in public facilities and, and in schools. How many of you were alive when school integration occurred? I see a few of you, the rest of you are children, absolutely children. Um, it's kind of interesting, we, I was having a conversation today with a group of students and I had a student who looked like probably 10th grade say, you know, do you, do you remember not going to school with people of color? And I said, yes, but you know, what, and it's a horrible indictment of me. I don't know that I thought about it as a small child because I also lived in a, an area of the country where there, were, there wasn't a lot of mixed ethnicity. I mean, for us to be mixed was Republican and Democrat or Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian. Those were the divisions. There were not, you know, where I'm from, there's not a lot of racial division. But I do remember when my school integrated and I was a sophomore in high school, 1967, and I look back now, and I was sharing with these students, my high school, small high school, rural community, 365 students in four grades, but the school integrated with two students, two young women of color who were juniors the year that they integrated. I was one year behind them. And I think I knew at that point how much courage that must take, but I really did not fathom until you're older. And I think as a parent, what you know, what that must have felt like to send your child into a situation, not knowing whether they would be welcome. And I think we've all sent our kids into situations where it's like, will they be accepted? Will they be excluded? You know, kids are pain, painfully mean sometimes. <laughs> they just are. And I, I think about those sorts of things and, and just wonder, you know, what it must have been like for all of those families. You know, we'll be coming back and, and we'll take a look as we move into the 20th century and we talk more and more about the Supreme Court and its rulings. We talk about Plessy v. Ferguson. We look at, you know, how we begin to bring ourselves together. And, you know, one of the things I'm reminded about so often is the American military was one of the great ways of at least gaining social mobility, you're gonna have a tremendous amount of black white from the South that will go to New York, to Chicago and those areas. But we're gonna kind of look at, even before Harry Truman integrates the military, the military is integrated, but it's segregated. There are units of African-American soldiers. There are who perform beautifully. I mean, no one can talk about any unit in World War I with any greater combat record than the Harlem Hellfighters and the numbers of Medal of Honors, Henry Johnson, the most famous. We're gonna look at maybe how ways that people can integrate themselves into society. And I see that I am actually 
about out of time, but I'm actually finishing. Jennifer, can you believe it? I'm two or three minutes ahead of time. Yeah, you were right on time. And I'm uh, fine. yes, it was it was very interesting. I didn't wasn't aware that all these laws got passed during that time. I've heard of I've heard of them, but I wasn't aware of the, the dates and that it was all connected in. So well, very it's kind good. of interesting because when you talk about Tilden and Hayes, it's sort of like when you talk about John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson. And we like to believe that our political system is such that it's holy because nothing is more important than our right to vote. And yet when you see this whole compromise that occurs in Congress and they look at Samuel Tilden, who's actually ahead and they go, ah, great chance, great try Sam, going back to New York, Hayes is gonna be president. And Hayes and then in turn is gonna liberalize things for white Southerners in the South. I mean, you just, you just wanna believe everything's always above board. I'm still naive. I may be old, but I'm naive. I just want everybody to be honest. That's why I'll never be a politician. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for all of you. Reconstruction is a, a very difficult period to talk about, and yet it is one of those legacies. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Ed, yeah. It, it, Ed just sent me a note. The History Club kids are getting ready to head in, and he, his note was the kids in History Club can get very excited all the best you know i figure i i'll be as excited with them we're talking about today in history club by the way for those of you that have grandchildren or children most of our students are middle school high school free classes absolutely incredible program but today i'm talking about what chattanooga looked like on the home front during world war ii so I get to do Victory Gardens and what was going on at Fort Oglethorpe and the volunteer ammunition plant. If only we had something we could blow up, ah, it would be wonderful. And with that, I will hush because we are about out of time. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. And I'd like to thank Linda for again, doing a, another great program. And just a reminder that next Tuesday on March 15th, we're gonna be doing the end of the Western frontier. So well, that'll hmm. be good. We'll be getting out of the South and the East Coast and going over to the West Coast. So. Oh, and we can talk about barbed wire and trails and gunslingers and yep. John It'll Wesley be... Harden. Yes, John Wesley Harden. Yes. Everybody's a favorite gunslinger. Okay, so with that, we'll see you all next week and have a good evening and stay dry. So. Oh, yeah. Thank you all in. so much. See you soon. Uh, see you later.